Welcome to I Hate It Here, the podcast for HR and people professionals, making the hardest job in the world just a little bit easier. I'm Hibi Youssef. The longest relationship you have in your life is the one with yourself. You are 24-7, oh 365, from birth till death. That is a permanent relationship. Everything else can be arbitrary. You could stop talking to your family, you could get divorced, you could stop talking to your friends, you could just go off grid. Still with you. So you got to get right with our relationship. And it's not an everyday game. There are days where I am super mean to myself and super hard on myself. But I remember, like, tomorrow's a new day. We're going to get through it. And you have people that will remind you of it. Don't let your employee experience become background noise. Instead, transform it into the backbone of your organization with First Step, the world's first and only intelligent communication platform. Over 500 organizations around the world, including 40 of the Fortune 100, rely on First Step to build stronger, more productive workforces. Visit firstup.io to learn more. So we're back with another episode of the I Hated Here podcast. I recorded this intro about three times and laughed through every single time. So I am just going to have a riot today, and I hope you're down to have a good time if you're listening to this uh, when you really need some entertainment. We were going to deliver it today because I have somebody joining me on the podcast today that the second I met them, I was laughing from the literal 10 seconds after meeting them, was laughing the entire time. I've never stopped laughing. You actually make me laugh all the time. And I've never had more fun with a person. Sorry to all my friends that are listening to this because (laughs) I've just never had more fun with the person. And I felt like you just really got me from the second we met. Okay. So without further ado, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, first of all, same. Um, (laughs) Like when we all got back from Transform, my core memory is when you were just like, everyone get in this car. And I was like, I'm not usually one to just like (laughs) take orders from people I met on the internet. But yeah, Heba, let's go. Um, So (laughs) same on just like the like connecting. I am Ryan May McAvoy. Uh, I am the head of people at Blackthorn.io. We're a SaaS company in the Salesforce app exchange with a suite of apps. Uh, We are a global team. I believe we're in 13 or 14 countries, 29 U.S. states. We run lean because we're bootstrapped. So it's me and a talent person who is basically the best. And as far as kind of my whole thing, I started in ski area HR when I was like a baby HR person, totally by accident. Um, I wanted to be a ski bum. And they have like these hiring fairs. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to work at a restaurant or something. They're like, so you have a degree. Do you like want to do HR? I was like, sure, whatever. I don't even know what that means. And it kind of just like rolled from there. I've now worked in ski areas. I have worked in veterinary clinics. I have worked in tech. I have worked in traditional brick and mortar businesses, worked for laboratories. I've kind of done it all. Uh, And my like feather in my cap of horrible moments is being an HR person in Santa Clara County, California during COVID because we were the strictest county in the world. And I know the topic today is quitting. So I have all kinds of tea for you on that. Um, (laughs) And then personally, I am a I'm a wife. Uh, I'm an auntie. I'm kind of an old lady. I know I've told Hubba this millions of times, really into like knitting and cats, Uh, really, really into collecting wine. So, uh, you know, just out here being wild. I just turned 40, which I'm going to tell everyone is the best thing ever. I don't know what flipped, but I am very much like in my unsubscribe era and just like, Oh, you have a bad attitude? Unsubscribe. I don't take it. Like, I just, pew, pew. No, I don't want to deal with it. Again, my, my, my whole motto for this year, less hangups, more hangouts. When I'm just like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with your bullshit. (laughs) Amen to that, girlfriend. Oh, well, I'm so excited that we're going to chat today about quitting. It's been the topic of the podcast the entire season. So like everyone I've had on, we've talked about it. And so I'm going to start with the question I'm asking everybody before we get into like why HR quits. What is one thing a company could do that would make you want to quit? I think it's the silence. I actually did a big post about this on LinkedIn the other day. It's the lack of acknowledgement. In my experience, both as an employee, as an HR person, it's not the person that's constantly like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go find something better. It's the, hey, I don't think I'm being paid fair. Hey, I need more flexibility with my family. Hey, I feel like the commentary isn't aligning with my values or we could try that again oh, yeah, yeah, and you get blown off, and then it festers. And good employees are going to continue to be good employees while they look for a new job. And that's where I think quitting is just, it's not the catering to, say, the dog and pony show. It's the you're not seeing kind of the obvious stuff because you're choosing not to. You're living in ignorance. You're you're not acknowledging, like, we could fix this or even trying. Mm. I can't solve everybody's problems. I can hear you. That's a huge step. We can continue to talk about it. 
I have updates on things like, hey, I don't have an update. My update is I don't have an update, but here's the steps I've taken to kind of like get to where we're trying to be closer to that goal. I feel that sometimes I tell employees like very candidly when they come to me with issues, I'm like, hey, I I really appreciate you bringing this up. I acknowledge that you're having this experience. I might not be able to change it. I just like straight up tell them, I like, I'm going to do what I can. There are certain things in the way of me being able to change these things. And I think honesty is the best policy in those. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies and HR teams would benefit from actually doing that. It's, it's interesting when people are afraid to do it. I always dig into the fear. I'm like, why are you afraid? What are you scared of? Well, I scared? feel like, and we were actually talking about this yesterday in a couple of the safe three stuff. We are all kind of paying for the sins of HR ghosts past. And I look at that. Um, I actually told the story of Transform when everyone was cracking up. We have someone who I consider old school HR in our neighborhood. She's on the HOA with my husband. She's now like my arch rival. She has everything that is wrong with HR. Like the first time we met, she's like, oh, are you like millennial HR with like well-being? And kind of like I was waiting for her to say the word snowflake. And I was like, definitely 10 out of 10. Also really big fan of like diversity, work-life balance. These are things. <laughs> and I knew it's not a fight I'm going to win. So just like to fill my own cup, like once every couple of months, I anonymously sent her an HR book from some, like Jessica's is next in the pipeline. Then I'm going to send her in, he says. <laughs> and like, she's never going to know it's me until we move. And then I'm going to have my Game of Thrones moments where I'm like, hey, girl, that was me. I'm and my hope is she reads HR one books. and maybe is better to her employees. She probably doesn't. Wow. She's probably like, this is trash. But, you know, we just we have to. But I think that's where a lot of the fear comes from, because we don't have people trusting us. We come in and we're like, I support you. I believe in these things. I'm going to be honest when I can't fix things. If they've had a bad experience before us, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, right. You're the company. You're you're the compliance. And you have to, like, work twice as hard to prove it. So it's it's a load on us HR providers. I always say, I think we start from the negative. I think I said that with my CEO earlier on episode this season. Like, I am always assuming when when people meet new people, it's like you start from a neutral place, right? Like, you don't know this person. But when you meet your HR person, I'm just like, okay, you're at a negative 20. My goal is to either get you to like zero or like in the positive. And like almost every single person I've met has had a bad, like, actually, I think like everyone on earth has had a bad experience with HR. I've had a bad experience with HR and I'm in HR. I think there's even like, it's kind of like clicky, like I feel like our group and our kind of generation or cohort or whatever you want to call it is really supporting each other, banding together. And then you have the traditional HR where we're fighting against. And it's almost like a mean girls club. It's like, oh, you're actually pushing for work-life balance. You don't, you kind of do things in the gray area. Like we had someone um, who needed a parental leave. He was three weeks away from FMLA and someone I'd asked a question in one of the communities you're like we have to make him wait till FMLA I'm like in no planet am I gonna be like see your babies in three weeks guys enjoy like no if he takes an extra three weeks at the end of it okay that sucks but he's with his kids I'm not like I think that's just where we fight that battle but then we also fight that same battle with the employees who've had that experience the infighting on LinkedIn between like old school HR and new school HR, and then the people who don't believe there should be HR, like those CEOs that all got on a podcast that were like, you know what you should try? Like no HR. I was like, you know what you should try? Getting sued because that's definitely what's going to happen to you when you don't have HR. And it's going to be well-deserved. Like what? what, Let's Let's try try no HR. I'm like, okay. Well, right. Let's just get rid of finance and maybe marketing too. Like, yeah, I mean, we, we don't, don't even need out. CEOs, right? We don't even need CEOs. They can go too. That was my favorite actual AI article that was like, could AI replace your CEO? And I clicked the title so fast. I was like, I don't know. Could it? Like, I'm like, you tell me. Like, I'm, I'm like, go with no for my CEO because he has such a great personality. But there you go. Maybe some well, I'm also waiting for like the can AI replace HR article. I'm like, please try me. Try to replace what I do. No AI is going to end up on LinkedIn lunatics and Reddit. We're not going to go <laughs> down that. So if that's what you're looking for, maybe. But again, like I feel like the the personality and the heart is what makes us what makes us. That's very true. OK, so today's topic, I want to talk about I've talked a lot about like when employees quit this season, but I want to talk about today when HR quits, like when you and I have reached the end of our rope and we're like, uh, mm, I got to go. So. I have to know first, I I know you have some stories. If you want to share them, you're more than welcome to. But I think the first question I have to know is, what has made you want to quit recently? Present job excluded. 
let's say, let's say like the last two or three jobs. Actually, my main story that I was going to share for this is the job before this. Um, and it wasn't really that there was one thing that kind of hit me until the very end. It was more of like people in my community and my network and my friends and my family being like, so you know, like you're miserable, right? And me being like, what? What are you talking about? And I feel like it's one of those where you hear people like, I don't know how I like worked two jobs and went to school because you're just in it and you do it. And then when I realized that I was like, oh shit, okay, so we got to fix this. And there was some really pivotal moments. Uh, my husband and I eloped during COVID because getting engaged Christmas 2019 was awesome for trying to plan a large party. Oh my and God. so we eloped in the spring of 2021. And I am a laptop. I call it my emotional support laptop. I bring it with me. I am superstitious. <laughs> I am like, if I bring it, nothing will happen. If I don't bring it, the world's going to catch on fire. We told like three people in our entire lives, including my former boss. And I was like, hey, Taking off Thursday, Friday, not bringing my laptop. This is why. Please do not tell anyone. I was in full hair and makeup, the dress, and they called me about something that was so unimportant. And I was like, okay, okay, cool. Don't love that. Came back, tried to express like, hey, this is probably why people are reporting that they're feeling burnout. They're feeling the pressure. And the response I got was, well, you didn't have to answer. (laughs) I thought somebody had like broken their leg or died or the office caught on fire. Like I kind of assumed a phone call knowing that it's like my wedding day was like something really bad has happened. So that was kind of the beginning of it for me. And then just like leaving that experience, it all started to kind of like you look back and you're like, oh my God, my former CEO, wonderful guy, has a heart of gold, really doesn't do well with feedback. And I don't know if that's just a confidence thing or if he really thinks he knows. But we always used to talk about like, I'm huge on this whole intention and reception of the words you say, because we can't control how our words are received. We can look at stuff as leaders, CEOs, HR, and be like, what is the worst possible way to receive this? And using the example of when you go into Slack and you say, everybody put in those extra hours. That's so awesome. And we're going to crush end of month and we love you. And then I would come in and be like, Hey, so I didn't have anything to do this weekend because like my shit is done. Um, yeah. But now I feel less valuable. Well, that's not how I meant it. OK, but that's how people are receiving it. And I think like the pivotal moment of that for me was I mentioned the whole COVID protocol. We were an in-person lab. Our county was out of control. The orders were changing. At one point, they were saying you should only go to the grocery store in these days, depending on what your address ended in. It got really intense. What? Santa Clara, I, I understand the intention. But December 2020, they changed the orders five times in like three days. And it was like, oh. you can't leave your house more than 50 miles and all this. So I'm trying to update people. And I'll never forget one of the leaders being like, you guys, Ryan May is just trying to keep us safe. And like, don't be mad at her. And I lost my shit behind the scenes. I was like, first of all, I'm not the governor of California. Second of all, I'm not <laughs> the county health officer. And then like, I always use humor, which I know you and I have talked about. So we had like an all company and I was like, you know what, guys? You're absolutely right. I was at the French Laundry with our governor, which was a huge scandal. We brought the county health officer and we literally sat there and decided how to ruin the 39 lives on this call. That was what the whole lunch was about. So now, you know, just to kind of be like, how ridiculous is this? And instead of like getting the point, our leaders were like, that was uncalled for. I'm like, you're throwing me to the wolves here, y'all. Like, Yeah. And I'm keeping OSHA off our back, which is a huge thing. The people who were in HR during 2020, we all deserve like a all expenses paid vacation or we need to class action lawsuit everyone <laughs> because Something. I just it was a wild time. Like you were in probably the, one of the hardest counties. I don't remember D.C. being that intense. We basically were just like we're shutting down. We're like knowledge workers. All of you are going home. Don't go see anybody. Then when we started coming back. My God, like someone got COVID and then they were in the room with somebody else. And then we had to tell everybody. And I was like, I am not a disease expert. Like I, I'm literally doing the best writing guidelines. on like, if you were sick, just don't come to work. And also like, remember if you're asymptomatic, we also don't know like what to do. And I just remember it felt like we were chickens with our heads cut off, like running around. Sending an email, like, here's how you wash your hands. You sing happy birthday twice. Like, <laughs> we're grown that, up. This is not what I went to college for. I remember that. COVID was a wild time. The, so wild. the note uh, the note on being called on your, like, elopement, 
you are just a much better person than me because I would have been like decline, go to voicemail. But I've also been there. Like I have been in the hospital getting like a small elective surgery that I had to do, but I was in the hospital. And I remember my boss at the time calling me to ask the most asinine question. It was something like, why does the calendar not work like this? What's my password? (laughs) I told her I was going out. So I messaged somebody else on our team and I said, you know, I'm doing this thing. I'm going to be under anesthesia like a little bit like you need to handle this. I like there, I was I had a close friend on the team and I basically was like, I'm going to lose my shit if I have to message this person back. So like, can you message her and remind her that I am out and you can help her with the calendar problem she's having? And I remember her being like, absolutely. I'm so sorry. I can't believe she bugged you with this. And so like having the people who also support you is super important. And I think that's where it's amazing to see employees like because from that relationship, I was gone within two and a half months. I was at my current wow. company now. And that whole thing, which I'll get into in a second, was like a divorce. That's how I've likened it in LinkedIn posts, in conversations, like leaving that oh. job was so hard. But then cut to six months later, I met Blackthorn. I had a really gnarly health thing. And I ended up actually like in the hospital, was getting a blood transfusion, which FYI is way more boring than Grey's Anatomy makes it look like. (laughs) And our CEO, like I was slacking with him and he's like, what are you doing? Why are you on Slack? I was like, because I'm so bored. He's like, no, seriously, like you're in the hospital. Maybe you should just chill. And I was like, please do not cut off Slack. I'm so bored. (laughs) And he's like, I'm telling you to rest. But okay, And it's just such a night and day difference where I feel like if I was at my old job, I would have been like, well, who, who's going to replenish the snacks? Who, who's yeah. going to make sure the badge codes are working? I, I don't care that you're on death's door. Like, and I was not even aware that I was almost dying in this. Re- so like my brain was probably not in a spot where I should have been like making strategic leadership decisions for the well-being of our people. Yeah, I feel that. I also my I have my current CEO when I was like going through it, I think like last year, I remember messaging him being like, I am like one thing from like a mental breakdown. And he was like, OK, you need to take a break. He literally was like, OK, I understand you need to take a vacation. Like he's like, you need to just take a day. You need to shut everything off. You need to not respond. I like don't want that happening to you. And I just like need you to go rest. Those leaders for HR, I think, make such a night and day difference. I was going to say, I think that's what it is, is no relationship is perfect. My CEO makes me crazy. I make him crazy. I'm sure you guys have the same relationship, but there's still the human element. And that's what I think, like, there was that, that, there was like a a year, maybe two, it was like a hot minute where like EQ was having its moment. Remember, everyone was like, we all need to be emotionally intelligent. We all need to have empathy. And like, it felt like every. Oh, yeah, I was like, can we can we have that again? But I felt like everyone was like so focused on it. And then everyone like forgot that we're still humans in the workplace. And they forgot to ask like, how are you? And how are you doing? And I and I do feel like we have more of a focus now on well-being and mental health than we've ever had in the history of work. But I do think for HR people, like having a leader who can have that conversation with you I think makes a difference between like staying somewhere and deciding to leave. 100%. And I think like it's the leaders, it's the team. I joke our head of talent is now like one of my real life besties. He's amazing. We have the relationship where we kind of have the same personality. We're a little bit smart assy. And we were talking about something (laughs) maybe two or three weeks ago. And I was like, yeah, you're like one of two men in my life that can be like, you're being crazy and I won't get more crazy. Like it's you and my husband. <laughs> like <laughs> you two are the only ones I could be like, I'm just going to throw it out here. Maybe it's you. Maybe yeah. like go have a snack, go like take a little walk. And they're usually right. Um, but it's again, having those teams. And our CEO is really open to like well-being being different. I mentioned I'm newly addicted to the Peloton eating a ton of crow because I was like, that's a cult. Y'all are crazy. And now I'm like, who's your favorite instructor? <laughs> um, but for me right now, Could that's a well-being me. thing. Uh, I, I, except for he kills me. I also have a little yeah. crush on Dennis Martin. Oh, I haven't taken any of the classes. Co- it's like Cody and Kendall that are my two. Oh, and I love Tunde. Tunde. Alex, Alex is also great. But Alex. Like, Dennis, I'll send you a ride. He did a cool down the other day and it was like the usher needed the like, wing thing. And I was like, sir, that's not a cool down. <laughs> not a cool down for elder millennial women. Thank you. Um, but for now, like our CEO knows. Like I'm like, you know what? I can't right now. So I'm gonna go take a brain break, do a little 20 minute Cody Rigsby ride, reset my shit, and then come back so I'm not like B 
being short, being aggressive, taking it personally. And I think that that's where even that EQ is just like, you don't have to understand. I don't understand people who run 50 mile marathons like my CEO does. Makes them happy. I support it. Yeah. I also like there are just things other people do that I don't understand. I know drinking has been a really hot topic. I like a glass of wine. I like a good cocktail. I also know I'm blessed. It's not a problem for me. It's not something. I'm also going to be very aware and respectful that that's not everybody's journey. And I think like I don't have to understand. I don't have to understand addiction to not be an asshole and be like, hey, we offer mocktails. We're calling it a social hour. Let's do something that's not at a bar. It's really just being aware. And it started for me in my HR spot like in 2015. I went to a talk and I cannot remember who it was. I wish I could. Though. They were talking about diversity and kind of being aware and stuff as the political climate was changing. And this woman just said, she's like, if you are a cis white woman, accept your privilege, learn to be uncomfortable in it. And I was like, <laughs> and I had to really like learn to be uncomfortable with it. I did. I had to learn to be like, okay, I'm not going to deny the way I look has helped. Yeah. I'm not going to deny like my name and all that has helped. How can I help? How can I be the person who says, I don't understand. I'm not going to pretend to understand it. I'm not going to pretend to relate to it. What can I do with myself and my platform and my privilege to make your journey better? And I think that bleeds into everything. I'm not a parent. I fully tell you to put time on your calendar to pick your kids up from school. I fully say like your kid is sick. Take the day off. Yeah. Because again, I'm not a total monster. That's just like, well, I don't understand that. So because honestly, if the if you are, you shouldn't be in this profession. Exactly. No, that's what I was going to get to. Like, it's empathy is at the core of everything we do. And I think, like, we have it for everybody. I'm, like, blessed to have you in my life, honestly, with with, and because you share that perspective and that value of, like, you appreciate the experience of others and you're going to advocate for others using your privilege, which I think is super powerful. I think a lot of HR people don't do that, but I've seen more and more people speak out against, like, especially, like, white women, great allies, when they're like, hey, I have this privilege. How can I help you? How can I understand the experience you're having? Vanessa, great example, wrote a whole book about taking down the patriarchy and how it impacts work. Um, Which is amazing, revolu- by the way. Call the revolution. Works. It's it. pretty good. It's pretty good. She has a lot of stories. Um, she's our friend. Uh, but I love that you shared that. But like empathy is at the core of what we do. But I find it interesting because I feel like no one has empathy for us in HR. I agree with you on like a business front. And I know you and I had a big conversation about this after Jessica posted like HR is not your friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, which was a whole, I, that girl, such a girl it's crush. Not, it I'm is I'm obsessed not with you, Jessica. Yeah. Um, and that's something that's really, I guess, as I've gotten closer to 40 and I'm in this kind of era of like not accepting things that don't fill my cup. Yeah. I seek my empathy in other places now. And I, I really have like this, philosophy for my own life where I'm a brick wall. One brick is being an HR person. One brick is being a wife. One brick is being a crazy cat lady. One brick is being an auntie. One brick is being a volunteer in my community. I have all these bricks and I never want one of them to tumble my wall if it were to go away or to lose my job or if I was to screw up at home. But I also know I can't do all of it at once. I'm going to be like the best podcast guest today and do a lot of great work probably going to forget to unload the dishwasher or do something that my husband definitely told me he needed done. That's okay. So it was a B minus wife today and an A plus HR person. Tomorrow may shift. I don't think that any human HR should tie your value to one thing because we're so many layers. And I think it takes a lot of self-awareness to be like, hey, you know, I was just being a real shithead that day. And I own that. I'm not going to make excuses for it. I own it. I was focused on these other things. I'm going to really try and be a better advocate, friend, partner, employee. And that's human nature. You just try again. And I think if you let yourself be consumed by like, I'm HR and everybody hates me. And sometimes it's the best defense because like we have moments. I don't know if you have like the anonymous surveys and stuff. Sometimes people come for HR. They say really, (laughs) really cruel things. I love and them. And it used to just, dis- oh, same, but it used to like destroy me. Like I would just oh, be like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I'm so hurt. And now I like laugh it off and I'm like, oh, I love that you think that I care. <laughs> I love that you think that I'm going to really stop being mean by telling you to like do this deadline that I, again, did not set. And this news that I, again, did, I'm just the messenger. 
It doesn't feel great that you think I'm a jerk because of it, but I'm also not going to define the rest of my day being like, somebody on anonymous portal said I was a bitch. Sometimes I'm a yeah. bitch. Yeah, that's actually true. So it's so funny. I always make this joke whenever we talk about anything anonymous. I'm like, the confidence employees have when they know it is truly anonymous is unhinged. But I also just love it because the comments are somewhat honest and also like a lot of them just like lack context too. They'll write something and I'll be like, yeah, if only you knew behind the scenes, like I can't, I've tried to fix that and I actually can't. When we also try to emphasize like going into an anonymous and being like, HR is a jerk. Okay, that that's cool if that makes you feel better. HR is a jerk because they wouldn't change my direct deposit. They aren't getting as good health care. Like, put some context to it and I'll explain to you why I'm not a jerk. But if you're just going to say I'm a jerk, I'm, again, I'm going to be like, really bold behind your anonymous keyboard, but I'm also very direct. So, Sam, that's also on my phone. I've got to, like, say it to my face. <laughs> I'd, ra- I'd actually rather you say it to my face. Yeah. We, did, um, we did something interesting with our Pulse survey, so we put an optional box that said, uh, share any comments you want to share, but then said, if you want us to follow up with you, you can put your name. Because we were like, I wonder if people would actually feel better if they could unload in a somewhat anonymous survey, but then also say, yeah, here's my name. I want follow up about it. And we have had a few employees actually put their names and I have followed up with them. And it's been very interesting. Because I'll follow up and be like, hey, you put this comment in. Like, is it one of these three things? And someone was like, no, it's actually something completely different. And I was like, okay, great. Help me understand. Context is everything. I was like, help me understand. Because I read your comment and I thought it was one of these three things. You're telling me it's something else. I need to fix this. Right? I think the worst thing you can do on an anonymous survey is like get all the feedback and then do nothing with it. So we also like shared openly to our employees like, here are the things we learned in the survey. Here are the things people were asking about. And then those things actually informed my goals for the next like three month, three quarters. And we we take our feedback very serious. Our managers all have access to it. Uh, we will screenshot stuff and say, hey, like this seems to be a common theme. Here's kind of the action we're taking or, hey, we can't Love change that. this right now. Um, yeah. Even this morning, our CEO was like, Hey, everybody, I keep seeing slacks and emails outside of hours. He's like, I ask you not to answer. I tell you we'll call you if it's an emergency. So it's really hard for me to hear that feedback because I feel like we are setting it up. And then this morning he came back. He's like, I'm deleting Slack and email off my phone. I encourage you to all do the same. If you're not working, you're not working. And I was like, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, uh, Yeah. (sighs) But I also have very strict do not disturb hours. Like uh, I, our team is global. So I'm online. I open my Slack at 6 a.m. Pacific and I close it about 738 Pacific. That's a good enough window. You should be able to catch me. Wow. Also, that's a more than nice window. That's more than eight I'm not hours. working all those hours, but like, I just feel like, no, okay, I'm giving you the availability. And on the flip side, my head of talent, I, when one of us is out, our Slack status is like out of office, talk to Roy, out of office, talk to RM. We really try and make sure like you can have a resource. You're not just waiting on us. Yeah. But I love and that I expectation you said, Mac. Our social Slack pops. So we tell them, if that's not good for your mental well-being, set your notifications. Set your do not disturb. Like, I don't expect you to want to see a picture of my cat on a Saturday. Like, I think it's funny, but you don't have to. And I don't want to cause you harm by posting it. During football season, we have like a sports channel and it pops off. It's even popping off right now on the weekends. That's like our number one channel that goes off on the weekends. And we've told people like, join it. Sports happen outside of working hours. So that is a slack that you will see during not working hours. But I mean, I think it's just really interesting how setting expectations is so key to our job and our like mental health. But I do feel like as HR, sometimes our expectations are and our boundaries aren't really respected. So I'm like happy to hear that you have like a a good support system that is respecting those boundaries. I also feel like as HR people, and I'm not trying to call us all out right now, we give the best advice. We give the best advice. We We rarely fucking take it. We just don't take it. Like we're like, (laughs) you should have work-life balance. You should not overwhelm yourself. You should not take this personally. And like, both your and I faces when we're like delete Slack and email, we're like, mm, I don't know if I, I could do, do that. that. I don't know if I could do we'll that. tell an employee that all day long. But like, that's where my therapist calls me out on this regularly. Props to Kevin. But he's like, you give a lot of really good advice. When's the last time you took it? And I'm like, 
listen, I don't pay you to personally attack me. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to answer this line of questioning because I'm uncomfortable. But like, I think that's where the biggest law. And I think that's the work that everybody's doing with the communities. Like Safe Space came to me. I was in a very down moment. I was extremely stressed. I was just at my wit's end. Laura, who we love, her and I were texting and she's like, nope, you got to join the community. Like, Get in here. And I was like, OK. And I did. And instantly it was just embracing and supportive and resources. And I think that is where we're now trying to change the narrative because you may not take a break. But if I'm like, Heba, you look like you're running on fumes, girl. You're like, I'm so exhausted. I'm like, so go take a break. Turn it off. Don't do yeah. it. Yeah. It's easier to hear from someone else. And I think that's what like we're really all working on now with supporting the networks and the communities and stuff because this shit is hard. Employees receive an average of 120 messages throughout their day. That can contribute to rising burnout and plummeting productivity. Cut that noise by up to 75% with First Step. First Step helps HR and communication teams deliver personalized communications at scale in a matter of minutes so that everyone, from your knowledge workers to your frontline workers, have the resources they need right at their fingertips. It's time to put your employees first. Visit firststep.io to learn more. You bring up a good point about community. I don't have anyone internally to go to. I am the head HR person. So like, who do I go to and I have a problem? Well, I report to my CEO. I could go to my CEO, but like, what if he is creating the problem? You know what I mean? Like, what if he is yeah. the problem? I'm not saying he is, but like, hypothetical. Like, what, what if you're if he the is? drama? Like, you don't want to be like, the drama? Hero. what if he's yeah. the one me out, right? Like, what, who do I go to then? And so I, I do love that we all have external communities. And I keep telling HR people, like, if you're really struggling, you need to be able to talk to somebody and we cannot talk shit to the employees. We just can't. That's just like, we don't have that luxury. And it's just mind boggling to me, the expectation of employees. I don't know if this happens to you. We have a very close crew, but if anything kind of major happens, a reorg, someone leaves, things like that. Yeah. I instantly get like texts or slacks like, oh, you didn't say anything. I'm like, in what situation? I'm going to be like, hey, by the way, John Doe. Yeah. That, that's never going to happen. You could be. And I say this as someone who worked with her childhood best friend. Me and my best friend mm. have been friends for over 30 years. And it was literally like, here's her resume. I am not involved. And the side conversation was like, if something goes bad, I have to be in that meeting. Because again, I'm the yeah. HR. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I could disagree. I could be on that. And I think like people don't understand like you have to have kind of these silos with that stuff. There's confidential stuff. And mm -hmm. that's where the community is so important. Because like when I was going through leaving my last job, which I know we're kind of tying to the quitting, I was struggling. Like, mm. I know there was a lot of emotion and a lot of hurt on my CEO's side, but really it took me three days to quit my job. And I am such a proponent of like an employee resigning is actually a gift, not because you're losing the talent and your budget line. Somebody truly is like, I don't want to be here anymore. Thank you. If you don't want to be here anymore, I would rather find someone who does, who's invested instead of just this quiet quitting in the background, collecting a paycheck. Thank you. Thank you for being honest to me and to yourself and like leaders who can't take that. And I think our seat, my former CEO was shocked because like it was meetings and what about this and what about that? And and the last moment, and I'll never forget it as long as I live, I was like, OK, well, I'm going to go talk to my husband. And my CEO looked me dead ass in my face and he's like, he loves me. I look forward to continuing to work with you. And I was done. I walked out of that office. I called my husband and I was like, OK, so I'm officially out. Um, this is what he said. And my husband was like, clearly, he doesn't know you. And even in that moment, I tried really uh. hard. Like the next day, I was like, I'm officially out. And I was like, again, let's talk about interpretation and reception. All I heard with your comment is that you actually believe that my husband likes you and cares about you more than my well-being. That's yeah. what I heard. He's like, well, that's not what I meant. I'm like, doesn't matter. That's what I heard. Here's my official notice. I'll also be working from from the next two weeks because I don't have a poker face <laughs> and I don't need people seeing me daggerize you. So, yeah. Oh, my God. I. Oh, God. I cannot believe he said that. Also, and I just. the second time. I quit a job before. Does, somebody's like, did you ask Phil? And I'm like, for what? <laughs> I don't need permission. My husband's not signing a permission slip for me to quit my job. Well, I also wanted to be like, I don't know what your relationship's like, but. I do think I probably mentioned I was thinking about quitting my job. I wasn't just going to like spring that him after the fact. Like, could you imagine just coming yeah. home and being like, 
guess what? <laughs> quit my job. I quit today. Bought a brand new car and we got a dog. Like, my husband is a very calm man and he'd be like, are you unwell? Like, <laughs> what is going on right now? Like, well, it's the base of a foundation. It's the foundation of a relationship, right? Like what decisions can you, if when you have a, when you have a partner, you have an additional lens to filter all your decisions through now. And that's such a gift. And they're not going to, if it's a healthy relationship, they're not going to just stop you from trying to make the decision you want, but they're going to give you good feedback and help you figure out how to get closer to like your ideal state. But I find that so interesting because I too have also tried to quit a job, two jobs actually, and it took like three weeks for me to quit the job. Like I was like, I'm leaving. And they're like, but but don't you want to, we can fix it. And I'm like, no, if it's gotten to the point where I am actively thinking about leaving and I'm comfortable enough to come to you to say it, there's no saving me. That is the thing about employees that I also wish HR and leadership would get. It's like if somebody is threatening to quit, you don't want them there. That means they're probably at least a little disengaged and they're not going to be doing good work. Louder for the people in the back. No more counteroffers. No more counteroffers. But it's also like not the end of the world. You can have someone resign and you can celebrate it. I've had so many employees resign where I've been like, I am so happy for you. I think this other opportunity is going to be amazing for your career and growth. I'm going to be your number one fan and champion on this side. Don't forget about me. Let's keep like an open relationship for when you like ever, if you ever need to talk, I'm here. I'm not just like disappearing. There's, There's this like weird power dynamic at play with people or like, I want to leave that it just turns sour for no reason whatsoever. You take it personally. And I think like that is something that's hard. You do invest time. You spend a good portion of your day with these. I look at something that I always try and say in terminations, resignations, whatever. Today is not the end of our relationship. One, because I know you're going to hit me in January for your W-2. Um... (laughs) (laughs) If you need a reference, if you're trying to buy a house in the next 12 months, like, you're, let's stay in touch. And honestly, like, tell me how it's going. I, I love that. I love hearing about that. I love knowing that you're finding you're happy. And I know, like, we were joking about this um, at Transform. My husband just went through a job change. And I was joking his old company must have me air tagged because they just kept kind of being like, what about this? Every time I was, like, out of the zip code. And they offered him <laughs> a counteroffer. And it was amazing. And I had to be like, which hat do you want? Do you want your wife or do you want HR? Oh, and yeah. he was like, <laughs> I want both. And I was like, as your wife, absolutely not. Hate them. Hate everybody. Holding a vendetta, even though you don't. And yeah. on the flip side, I was like, the financial part, I'm solid with it as a counteroffer. My questions to you for you to make this decision are, what have they invested in you in the last six months? What if they showed to value you in the last two years of you saying, I'm tired of working this many hours. I know I'm underpaid. And he was like, yeah, I'm not going to stick with that. And I know all of us were talking about it because I was like, I need someone to tap into the HR village wives. And like, we're about yeah. to go like real HR housewives of California over here. And two of my really good friends who live in town are HR providers. I had them queued up. I was like, you need to go have a talk with this man. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be like the HR intervention. I was like, this is my new side hustle. We're all just going to have like a collab. And it's like, oh, my husband's not going to listen to me. My wife's not going to listen to me. So like someone else tags in because it's the third party. Yeah. Like just be like, we're just all going to like co-op it out. Be like, oh, he's interviewing. Okay, prep him, review his resume. He's not going to listen to me. Like, and I think that's, yeah, it does. And all of those things, even for us, like, am I thinking about leaving my job? I want to talk to people who understand that. Amazing people in my life. Great support network. I have a wonderful partnership with my husband. He doesn't understand. And it's not a slight on him. I he explains engineering stuff to me and I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. That's cool. I I really think nobody understands this HR job. I really think until you do it, until you do it and have the weight of all the things that we have on our shoulders, I don't think anyone understands it. And I know CEOs have a similar but different struggle where it's like, their success is very much tied into the success of the company and they have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. Like I understand their struggle is a little different because I think ours is a lot of that, but also like the emotional aspect of being at work. The human side. The human side is like, I don't think people truly understand or appreciate how exhausting this job is. And I mean, like I've said that so much this season, it's exhausting, but it's exhilarating. Like Erica just said that on one of my most recent episodes, like it's exhilarating when you can do the work in good environments. But the reality is a lot of us aren't in good environments. 
And then not only are we sad, but we're the HR people at work, but we're also the HR people in our personal life. Like my friends come to me for all their HR advice, right? They're like, oh my God, you're HR. I have a new rule in my life. If I don't talk to you outside of your HR questions, I will be like, if you want to Venmo me $50, I will consult for you. But like, we all have those friends. Like, I don't know if you follow, there's a, he's like Matt the lawyer on TikTok and Instagram. He's like, you get this great gift when you graduate law school where every three to four months, somebody's like, hey, bro, haven't talked to you since high school, but just curious, is it illegal to do this? I think we get it too. <laughs> like, we get like, oh, my HR is telling me this. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I'm i sorry. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you expect from me in that. Like, And I know there's a theory of like your social circles. You have your nuclear family, your really close friends. After that, if you're not in the first two to three circles, I'm not trying to be HR for free. Like, I've invested a lot of time, a lot of effort. And on the flip side, like the hardest part of quitting any job for an HR person, I think, is leaving our people. At my last job, these are people who came to my big wedding when we finally had it. Like we still stay in touch. Two of them were my closest friends from before working there that I had brought in. That was really what kept me longer. And I'm convinced now after much therapy, that's why I just kind of denied that I was so unhappy because I wasn't going to leave these people. Uh, and even oh, like right. when SVB fell, I knew they were on Rippling. That was the whole thing. I don't know how I feel about Rippling, but I'm not going to go there. I swallowed my pride, texted my former CEO and was like, hey, you should probably look into this just so your payroll is not messed up because people I care about pay their bills off that. Like that was the whole intention. Oh, I still I love and I was like, why do you have to make it weird? Like why? I'm trying to do something <laughs> nice. And like, okay, it was done. And then I was literally joking with my friend who used to work there. Like, he's like, oh, that was such a good deed. I was like, I don't want it. I want to go back to neutral. So we were like joking. We're like, what do you do that's like bad karma that just offset that? Like, do I just got to go litter or something or like say a bad word in a church? Like, how do I like, how do I offset the good deed of reaching out to this man that I never (laughs) want to talk to again? It's the people. seriously, you care about the people. people. And I don't think we get credit for that. Because we can't show that at work. Like, we can't be like, I'm devastated you're do- – layoffs. No HR person I know has not, after the fact, been like, I cried. I had to take a hot bath. I got into my community. Like, but you can't show that on a layoff because it's not about you. It's, not, you're, it's never you're about, not about you. Yeah. And so that's where we have to walk the fine line. Like, we're still humans, y'all. We still have feelings. Just because we're really good at putting them away during the talk doesn't mean they don't exist. Yeah, but I feel like people forget that. It's so interesting. I've been I've been I've been noodling on this idea and I want to like talk to you about it. I'm I've arguing. been noodling on this idea that I feel like you and I are both really authentic people. Like in my life, my friends know I will tell them like that dress is ugly, don't buy those shoes. That's a bad decision. That person doesn't love you. They're not worthy of your time. Like I am like the person people come to for like the real dose of honesty. That's what you need. But I feel like I'm playing this game sometimes of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I guess, well, actually, that's a bad dynamic because one of them's evil and one of them's good. (laughs) I mean, I have my moments. To be clear, maybe I'll do the – what about – okay, because I never watched the Miley Cyrus show. Did you watch the Hannah Montana? Yes. Isn't she like – she basically just put a wig on and she became famous, Yeah, she like became a different person. she was the same person. person. Okay. Let's use that analogy, even though I am an elder millennial and I literally did not watch Hannah like, Montana. I was thinking I, of Phoebe like, when she has her twin sister on Friends and like one's really spacey and then. Like, but like, isn't her other sister evil? So like, OK, it's true. Let's Dang. do this in a reality where there's like no evil person, right? You're you're the same person. You just like put a wig on and you're someone else. Sometimes I feel like I can be one thing in my life and like uphold all my values and be like the best version of myself. And then I get to work and I almost have to like professionalize myself to a certain extent, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm butchering this idea. But I feel like I can never truly be myself at work because there are things to the HR job that don't allow me to truly be myself. And I think my example, if this makes sense, is like politics. I am not going to show up to work and talk about politics because what that means to me is like politics are deeply personal. And right now we're at a c- part in our country where like it is very divided and the feelings are strong across the board. And people associate a lot of their values with their political beliefs. I'm not going to show up at work and like spout my political beliefs because there 
a part of inclusion to me is that there is somebody who's going to have other ideals than I have. And I have to create a space where they are allowed to do that, even if I think their ideas are bad. You know, I draw the line at like if they're saying dangerous things in the workplace, but like if they just have a different view than me or are pro something that I'm against, I find it hard in the workplace because like I can't show up and talk about politics. And so sometimes I can be one thing in my personal life and with my friends and in my community. And when I show up at work, it's almost like I have to sterilize myself to a certain extent. It kind of ties into the same thing. I just don't put that energy into kind of my HR self. I, I bring it mm. to the community. I bring it to my friends. I also try to be as transparent as possible. I grew up outside of Colorado Springs, which politically is one way that doesn't super align with my values. doesn't matter either way, which whatever it is. And if people ask me, I'm honest. I'm like, it's just a different experience for my life. I moved to the Bay Area and I saw people of different diversity, which was not something super common. And that's really an experience I cherish. It's not for everybody. And that's okay. Um, But we had someone, I actually, I feel like being a little bit open with like, I don't have all the answers. I feel how I feel. I don't expect you how I feel. I had posted something a year, maybe a year or two ago about equal pay day. And one of our employees, he's like, hey, I want to come to you one-on-one, was like asking me questions. He's like, I found this article that kind of disputes what you're saying. And I was like, okay, well, let's talk about it. And literally both articles quoted the same survey. And I was like, I'm not telling you how to think. It's your opinion. I don't know where this article came from. They're using the same data set. So while that tells me in this conversation that we're having, which was very friendly and I felt very fulfilled from it, is we can take anything and turn it into whatever narrative we want. And it is not my job to tell you to believe one thing. He at no point told me to believe something else. And it was very powerful. And it felt really good that he was comfortable enough to come ask me that question. Like, yeah. And I think that's where, like, being authentic... I I would liken it to volumes. I'm not as politically loud at work as I am outside of work. Mm, But I'm also very much like I have my opinions. They do not reflect the company. They do not reflect the values. There is also a line. If you are being hateful, discriminatory, violent, that's not going to stand. I don't care which side of it you're on. Even if I agree with you, that's not going to stand. And I think that's where we really have to learn, like, to embrace like we're humans. I say this to our team often, like, hey, I'm one person. Here's the 12 tickets I have right now. That's what I can give you. Yeah. If this is what you need. And even this week, our team was really responsive. I I posted in our manager channel. I was like, hey, it's open enrollment. If I'm denying things because they're not life or death, that's why. It's nothing personal. And on the flip side, if there is life or death, (laughs) just like grab me and we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like the world has to stop because I'm in data Hades at the moment. Yeah. Like, (laughs) that's okay. (laughs) But like, just really prioritizing. And even with the asks, I've now responded. I'm sure you get this too. Like, oh, hey, just a quick ask. And they could find it in the HRS. They could find it in the payroll system. I'm like, it's never a quick ask. But the thing is, even if it is, I'm always like, well, there's a hundred plus of you. So if every single one of you has a quick (laughs) ask today, that's a hundred asks plus my job, plus like all the other shit I'm responsible for. Yeah. So. We've really, and even like when we moved to Hi Bob, we went on a full campaign. We put like Bob emojis in Slack. Every time we presented on it, it was Bob Ross, Bob Barker. Like we went on a full thing and people now know, like Bob is like a person. I would joke he's the third person of the people team because I'm like, (laughs) it's in my bestie Bob. Like, and it really has helped. People are like, okay, I looked in Bob and this is what I found, but I have a question. Great. Come to me with that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think it's just acknowledging like I'm still a human being. But again, people forget that. Okay, so I want to end with like a a very big question. So don't hate me for this. Why do you think a lot of HR people are contemplating quitting? I think they're just beaten down. They're not acknowledged. It's an island. And that's why I'm super grateful to you for our little community and for everyone who participates um, and is just so welcoming. You're on an island. Because the employees don't see you as an employee. Leadership doesn't see you as an employee or a fellow leader a lot of the times unless you're in a really good spot like you and I are. Mm -hmm. So you have two groups and bodies saying like you're nothing. Okay, well, you're also nothing who's handling highly emotional stuff. You're nothing who's working through compliance. You're nothing who could be having the worst day of your life and you just have to like tuck that away. And I think that's why people are leaving. People are like, 
I'm a human being and I need, and you know, Anissa talks about this on LinkedIn all the time. She's like, I worked 20 hours this week and that worked great for me. Yeah. It's so worth it. Um, it's so worth it for you to be able to embrace those boundaries. And that's something that like I have said moving forward, I will have to acknowledge that I'm a human being and I have to have at least the safety to say like, I slept like shit last night. I had terrible dreams. I'm not on my A game today. I'm here. I've shown up. I'm being very clear. Like if you're going to be like, can we do an international compensation study in the next 30 minutes? I'm going to be like, no, absolutely. I cannot. (laughs) I cannot. I couldn't even do that on my A day. So it's definitely not happening today. But having that safety. And I don't think that that's provided in a lot of spaces. And I think we have that piled with the pressure of everyone on our outside life. Hey, I just have a quick HR question. Hey, can you write me this? Hey, can you do that for me? Other than our communities and our like close family and friends. Who's coming to you and saying, like, hey, what do you need? Hey, where are you at? Like, God, no one asks. What are you supporting? And that's the thing is, like, I feel like we have to continue the conversation. We have to continue these relationships. Because as a 40-year-old woman, I went into Safe Space before Transform and was like, is anyone feeling like it's the first day of school? And we're really nervous. And I'm just super. And I posted it. And, like, 20 people were like, same. And everyone's like, okay, here's where we're meeting. And then it was just, like, old friends. It wasn't. Yeah. Whereas if you would say that at work, like, oh, I'm just really nervous. They'd be like, but you're HR. You're supposed to be like it, everything. Yeah, you're supposed to be in charge. And I it's do, just one of I those things. It. I do and love I think safe like, space. Oh, if you haven't joined Safe Space and you're in HR, please do. Um, I can't. We turned this whole episode into like a Safe Space deep dive, essentially. This is not like intended. Do the unofficial sponsorships. Join Safe Space by Jessica Winder's book, Hidden Gems. Uh, yeah. Also by Anissa's book. And the yeah, microphones. if you're listening, please sponsor <laughs> Heba and I. Um, but I think it's having those people Dying. in your life that are real. And I have a great friend. He's an EA at Google. I always joke his tagline is, did you bring anything else? Because he's that friend. You wear something and he's like, it's not bad. Did you bring something else? <laughs> and then I see a picture later and I'm like, God, he's right. Or I've changed. And I'm like, oh, I feel so much better about myself. Yeah. It's one of those things where you have to be able to take the hard truths good and bad. And I think like we're so beaten down right now. It's hard to have those hard truths. Even if the hard truth is you're burnt out, you're disrespected, you're tired. I was very resistant to it in 2021. The first person that's like, girlfriend, this is not it. I was like, Shh, you're out of your mind. I have a great you don't know me. I am thriving. Um, and then after the fact, like I started a Blackthorn, things were, I call it fun chaos we always have some sort of chaos but it's usually pretty have funny chaos Same. Same. and my husband's like did you not really and I was like no he's like you were crying and drinking like heavily and I was like what are you talking about he's like you literally would cry two to three times a week you were literally drinking two to three bottles of wine a week and I was like oh my god and it's that's where for me now again I don't think I've struggled with addiction I don't want to be finishing my day like I need a glass of wine yeah I want to finish my day and be like I could have did this better today in the HR space, but you know what? I remembered my nephew's ball game and I sent him a little message or I remembered to send them a little gift or things like that or like sharing PKHR and things like that. Like I remember to do those things. So tomorrow I'll probably be better at that and maybe I'll forget to reshare something on LinkedIn that somebody's asked me to do or. Or just a game of balance. This just job being is kind just to a- yourself. Yeah. That's a wonderful place to end. That was a wonderful place to end. Be kind to yourself. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think I'm very kind to myself some days and I have to remind myself that. It's a struggle. But i that's the thing, like, I actually have it written on a post-it on my desk from, again, Kevin the therapist who, game changer, very much was like, you just need to be like, what would I say to not me? What advice mm. would I give Heba if you said you were burned out? Would I give that advice to Ryan May? Because at the end of the day, the longest relationship you have in your life is the one with yourself. You are oh my God. 24-7, 365, from birth till death, that is a permanent relationship. Everything else can be arbitrary. You could stop talking to your family. You can get divorced. You can stop talking to your friends. You could just go off grid. You're still with you. So you got to get right with that relationship. And it's not an everyday game. There are days where I am super mean to myself and super hard on myself. But I remember like tomorrow's a new day. We're going to get through it. And you have people that will remind you. Laura is a great example. If I'm like feeling down in the dumps, I text her and she's like, you got this. Like, psh, what? You're awesome. And I think that's where... Asking for help is becoming important because we haven't in the past. Oh, that's a beautiful place to end this episode. I 
feel my heart is so full and I feel like I just went to therapy and I'm going to need to go cry and lie down for a little bit. I need a midday nap. I mean, I, I support, I'm all into naps, so. Oh, good nap. Okay, but tell people, so people listening to this, how can they get in touch with you? What's the best way to find you? LinkedIn is the best place to find me. I live on LinkedIn. Um, I'm also now on the Peloton social side if you're looking to join me on a ride. (laughs) Um, I would say Instagram, but honestly, 99% of Instagram is just like pictures of my cats, so. I love that. Well, I'm gonna have to go follow that because I don't follow This is my soulmate cat. He's sleeping in the back. Uh, His name is Bruce. He had a middle name after a rapper that we no longer acknowledge, so. Oh, okay. Just Bruce. He's just he's Bruce just now. He's just like, Bruce just now. Bruce. Well, like there's some Prince. jokes because he's kind of mean. He's now Bruce Wayne Gacy, Brucey, Mr. Squishy Face. He used to be Bruce Kanye, but for obvious reasons, he had to. We struck that name from, from the record. We struck we did that the name legal, from the record. We did a legal name change because we just we didn't actually need did that. when we changed it to my married name at the vet. I was like, can we just take that off? Oh, wow. I was like, I'm you just dying. don't want to be associated with it anymore. Like, it's just not a good spot for me to be. <laughs> it just doesn't where I want to be. Okay, well, Ryan, thank you. Ryan May. I always call you Ryan. Either I way. just, like, drop the May. Ryan May, thank you for joining me today. What? You could call me Ryan, Ryan May, RM. The only time I tell people is you can tell if I don't like someone. I'm like, actually, it's Ryan May. Like, that's when you know you've crossed the line. And I'm like, <laughs> we're not cool like that. <laughs> we're not cool. We're not friends. Call me Ryan May. But okay, you, thank you. So call me whatever you want because I love your face. Yay! Okay, I love you. This is so fun. Yes. Thanks for tuning in. Keep up with all the latest HR resources by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen. And if you love I Hate It Here, tell an HR friend. I'll see you next time.